Hi, I'm Ben and welcome to my presentation on what's the leading cause of antibiotic resistance and how we best tackle them in the future. Uh, so I'm going to be sort of giving you a brief uh, overview of my, uh, my topic and then talking a bit more generally about my EPQ. Uh, so starting off with a sort of introduction to antibiotics, um, the basic purpose is to kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria. Uh, they've been used from, for thousands of years, derived from plants. Uh, but the first true antibiotic was discovered in 1928 by Sir Al uh, Alexander Fleming, which is this person, person here, um, and that was penicillin. Uh, there are now obviously a huge amount, over 100 different varieties of antibiotics, uh, arranged into five main classes. Uh, and they're used in a range of routine and complex procedures. Um, resistance itself was first witnessed around 1950. Uh, so how do antibiotics work? Well, antibiotics are either um, bacteriostatic or bacteriocidal. So uh, bacteriostatic antibiotics simply inhibit the growth of bacteria, while the bacteriocidal antibiotics, they actively kill the bacteria. Um, and the way they work is that they're, they're small molecules and they're specific to the specific parts of a bacteria. So here's an example of one. They're very small basic molecules. Um, and they, they, they work essentially by targeting features which are specific to bacteria. So here we have a, a standard bacterial cell and here a standard uh, animal cell. Um, and a few differences between the two are bacteria have RNA as their, new, um, as their genetic material compared to DNA in animal cells. Uh, we have different structures of our ribosomes, our cell membranes. Uh, bacteria have a cell wall, which is not present in animal cells, uh, amongst a few other things. And the way these work is that these antibiotics target the features specific to bacteria, and by doing so, don't affect human cells. Um, they, are, they can be produced naturally and synthetically, and they're usually ingested or injected. Um, so how does resistance itself occur? Well. What's important to know is that it is actually a, natu a completely natural process, uh, just a normal evolutionary mutation. But as you can see here, there's a very, very small chance of it actually happening. Um, that small. The, the, the reason it becomes a widespread problem is because there's a lot of factors which really up those odds. Um, one of which is their very quick reproductive time, um, some as quick as 20 minutes which might not sound like a lot, but that means in half a day you could have over a million. Um, and this means that every time uh, that there's an, uh, reproduction occurs, there's you, you, that is one of the chances, uh, you have that chance of developing resistance. Um, and also obviously that ups the odds massively. Um, bacteria also, a single bacteria developing resistance on its own is not much of a problem. What does become a problem is something called horizontal gene transfer. Um, so as animals and humans, we transfer our genes vertically, so down to our offspring. Um, bacteria have the ability to actually transfer their genes between fully grown, uh, sort of mature bacteria. Um, and this means that when one bacterium develops resistance, they can easily pass that on to others, uh, and eventually a whole colony become, can become resistant. Um, there are various methods of how this resistance actually manifests. Uh, I won't go into them too much, in too much detail, but uh, some examples are these efflux pumps, which simply the antibiotics get into the cell, these pumps just pump them back out. Um, the bacteria can produce enzymes which uh, destroy the antibiotics, um, or they can alter some of their, the structures in their cell to prevent the antibiotics working. Uh, there's also a human side to this. So, as I said before, the, the whole process of actual resistance occurring is completely natural, um, but humans also contribute to sort of upping those odds, um, mainly through their misuse. Uh, so a primary um, sort of area this happens in is in medical settings, so GPs, pharmacies, all that kind of stuff. Um, by misprescribing antibiotics, uh, you're essentially increasing the bacteria's exposure to those antibiotics and increasing the chances of those resistance genes arising. Uh, it's also used in, agri in uh, farming, so in, uh, with animal feed and use in pesticides. Uh, we also release a lot of toxic waste uh, into the environment. And all this, again, just exposes bacteria to, lo to low levels of antibiotics and increases their, their chance of developing resistance. Um, 
Uh, so how will this affect us? So to understand how it will affect us, we have to look at how it, will cu how it currently affects us. So here are some of the statistics. We have currently 700,000 deaths a year worldwide uh, caused by uh, resistant bacteria. And in Europe alone, the cost is about 1.5 billion. Uh, and that comes from a range of different costs. Um, by 2050, there is scheduled, there's uh, predicted to be 10 million deaths a year, which is currently more than cancer kills today, um, largely in developing nations. So you can't really see this map, but the majority in Africa and Asia. Uh, the economic uh, impact is estimated about 100 trillion a year, which is about 2 to 3 percent of the global economic output. Uh, obviously, the most at risk will be the vulnerable groups, the el uh, elderly, newborns, and those on immunosuppressants. Uh, and the sort of day-to-day -day impacts will mean um, higher risks for things like uh, chemotherapy, uh, joint and organ uh, replacements, uh, pacemaker surgery, a whole range of surgeries, um, as well as things like acne, UTIs and STIs, and infections like cuts and scratches. Um, yeah. Uh, so how can we change? What can we do? Um, well, in terms of actually changing our behaviour, th there is a lot. We can, I mean, it all stems around really reducing unnecessary use of antibiotics. So primarily in medical settings, um, not prescribing them unless they're absolutely necessary, uh, not misprescribing them for things like viruses, which can't be helped with antibiotics. Um, reducing the use in agriculture, uh, again, taking them out of animal feeds, taking them out of pesticides, uh, reducing our environmental waste, uh, once again with antibiotics and other toxic chemicals. And this is all essentially the problems that we've created, it's just uh, sort of going back on those problems. Uh, better public education hygiene, so ensuring that people are properly using antibiotics if they are prescribed. Uh, and also uh, better hygiene standards just minimises the risk of any sort of infections. Uh, and also renewed efforts to develop new drugs. So there is a big uh, sort of uh, void. There's not a lot of drugs really being developed at the moment. It's quite costly and there's quite limited returns. And so uh, things like government backing and funding would be very useful. Um, and lastly, revisiting old antibiotics. So we have developed antibiotics in the past which have been considered too dangerous, uh, perhaps as side effects. Um, but these now are more desperate. We might have to turn back to these. Uh, in terms of new solutions, uh, one of the first ones is vaccinations. So vaccinations, you often think of viruses, but uh, in examples such as typhoid and cholera, uh, which are uh, bacterial diseases, uh, they're very reliable. Uh, and so there is the possibility of using these. Um, they could be used on the most dangerous strains um, and, uh, and or potentially for the, only the most vulnerable uh, people that need it. Um, obviously there are a lot of disadvantages to this solution, it's very costly, there are a lot of strains of bacteria that you'd have to vaccinate against and vaccinating whole populations, uh, obviously very costly. Um, there's always the potential for bacteria to mutate again uh, and that is actually a very real problem because uh, it, it would require their new vaccines to be developed uh, and with some bacteria species uh, gone it could leave the gap sort of open for other species to come in. Uh, and be just as damaging. Uh, another new solution is these things called bacteriophages. So this is actually a diagram of one here, quite bizarre looking. Um, and this is a couple of them attacking what is here a cell. Um, what they are essentially is the same way we have viruses that affect us. Uh, bacteria have uh, sort of their own viruses which only attack bacteria. Um, they've been known about for quite a while, but. Uh, we haven't really looked into them that much because we've always relied on antibiotics. Um, bacteria have no defence against them. They've been around for billions of years. Um, they're very specific. Each one will only attack one specific uh, species of bacteria. Um, and they can be genetically modified. Um, most importantly though, they have been used successfully in trials before. A very limited number, but um, they've been used well uh, and they are reliable. Uh, the disadvantage is, once again, it's cost. Like with a lot of these things, it's very costly. They would have to be specific to each person. Um, the research into them so far is limited, uh, and also the, the sort of genetically uh, modifying part of it. If we have to genetically modify for every individual person, 
would be very time consuming uh, and very costly. However, it is the most favoured option by scientists uh, and the most sort of likely long term solution. Uh, there are a few other solutions. Um, these are more minor, uh, so we have a, uh, these things called adjuvants, which essentially uh, enhance the, the function of the antibiotics. You take them in combination. Um, antivirulence therapy, which is more about blocking off the bacteria um, and preventing the damage they do, and uh, ways of strengthening the, own uh, the body's own immune system uh, to make it more resistant against any sort of infection. Uh, but the most likely outcome will be a combination of some of these and perhaps some of the earlier solutions, as well as uh, a change in our own behaviours, uh, and then that's really the long-term solution. Uh, so talking finally a bit about the EPQ in general, um, it's been a great experience. Uh, to just, just a few of the skills I've learnt really, um, research and analysing information, uh, finding new scientific sources, um, and sort of understanding them and putting them together. Uh, sourcing and referencing is obviously quite a new skill, uh, quite time consuming, but it's sort of a new skill and a good one to learn. And learning to write analytically and write scientifically and write an essay of this length, which I've never had to do before. Um, things I found difficult, obviously um, finding this information and understanding it. There's a lot of new scientific language, a lot of new terminology. Uh, and also sourcing um, articles that uh, complement each other as opposed to some which kind of um, have disputed figures. Uh, and lastly, what would I do different? Um, I'd spend more time doing research at the start. That was something that became quite an issue. I sort of got a bit rushed. Um, and I would have tried to talk to a professional, perhaps, uh, to get their sort of opinion on the matter. Um, but apart from that, uh, I thoroughly recommend the EPQ. It's been a very good experience and I've very much enjoyed it. So thank you.